Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Overcoming COVID-19 Disinfection Challenges, featuring Pete Miko and Nate Seward. We're really appreciative that you're joining us here today, and we're ready to get started. My name is Jason Lipsy, and I'm the channel manager for cleaning and restoration for Procure One. We appreciate, again, you joining us today. And before we get started, I want to share some important information. Uh, first, I want to introduce you to Kristen Queel. She's the one that's been welcoming you in early uh, to this webinar today. Kristen's our inside sales manager for Procure. Uh, she's going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A during the presentation. So please, please, please uh, chat over any questions you might have uh, through the, the chat function or the Q&A function during the presentation. We'll be stopping periodically to answer those questions that you might have about uh, overcoming your COVID-19 disinfection and cleaning challenges. Second, we're recording today's webinar. So I wanted to let you know that uh, if you're on here, you're going to get a link automatically uh, to this recording later this week. Also, you'll find a recording of this webinar on both the Pathogen Alliance website, that's pathogenalliance.com, or the Procure website, which is procure1.com. You'll see that loaded later this week. So uh, a recording will be uh, emailed to you and you can access it on either website. Uh, third, at the completion of this webinar, we'll be sharing some, we'll be sharing contact information for Pete and Nate, inclusive of uh, phone numbers and websites. Also, there is a really short uh, survey with just a few questions. Please, please, please uh, help us answer those questions. Uh, we want to make sure that this was a valuable webinar for you and any other things you'd like to cover in the future. So our anticipation is that we're going to have another webinar in the early part of 2021, but we certainly value and would like your feedback on that. Uh, lastly, uh, this webinar is for informational purposes only. Contractors performing professional disinfection services should ensure they maintain the proper training and certification, insurance and contracts. The requirements and scientific, uh, the requirements and scientific community understands um, that information regarding this virus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, is constantly changing and that contractors should always rely on the most recent and accurate information regarding SARS-CoV-2. So with that, let's get started today. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, if you could just confirm you can see this okay, Kristen, I would greatly appreciate it. Looks good. Awesome. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, would like to introduce our two uh, participants here um, for today's webinar. First is Nate Stewart. Nate is a certified industrial hygienist and the founding partner of the Pathogen Response and Resource Alliance. Nate is a professional engineer, IICRC instructor, and has over 23 years of environmental and industrial hygiene experience that includes protocol development and supervision of multiple a COVID-19 disinfection and cleaning projects. So Nate, we're really pleased to have you with us here today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Nate's partner in crime here today is Pete Miko. Uh, Pete has owned and operated several companies uh, in the cleaning and restoration industry for over 25 years. He's a founding partner of Procure and supports protocol development and support on losses of all types across the country. Pete, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. So today we hope to cover the following on this, uh, on this uh, webinar with you. Uh, we wanna go through um, most up-to-date information about SARS-CoV-2, uh, how it's transmitted, uh, how long it may last on certain surfaces. Uh, we wanna really then get into you the, on the front lines, helping to make environments safe and healthy to come back into. So uh, certification and training, protocols and development, uh, and development and documentation. Uh, chemistry, what you should look for in various products, and then just the application, which is the reviewing process as a part of this. As I mentioned, at various points during this webinar, we're going to answer your questions. So please, please, please be uh, jump right in and chat over questions that you have for Nate and for Pete. Uh, and at the very end, again, we will share their contact information as a part of this webinar. Thanks again for being with us. With that, Nate, I'll turn it over to you. All right, everybody hear me okay, hopefully. Perfect. Uh, thanks, uh, Procure team, for, uh, for helping put this on. So uh, my name is Nate Seward. I'll be kind of talking about this, uh, this virus at the beginning here. Um, and, uh, you know, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for joining. Thanks for, um, 
you know, you guys are, as Jason said, you guys are on the front lines of cleaning and disinfecting buildings, which is a critical component for managing this, uh, this pandemic. So <clears throat> just a, a, a few slides here on the, on, on about the SARS-CoV-2. Um, as a lot of us already know, this was a, um, a novel corona that broke out in China and re re resulted in a cluster of pneumonia cases, which um, quickly spread throughout the, the world. And, uh, and we know it as COVID-19. Uh, COVID um, the coronavirus is, uh, or there's a, gr a group of uh, coronaviruses, including some that we've already had some uh, information. Uh, uh, the first coronavirus in 2003, the MERS, uh, those are all kind of uh, similar but different from what we have today. So uh, we do know a little bit about these coronaviruses, but uh, again, there's it's kind of got these twists to to this new one that we're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> so uh, next slide, please. Uh, obviously, we know how infectious this virus is. Um, it is what we call an enveloped virus, and uh, you know you've probably seen a lot of these similar pictures here on the slide here of what this virus kind of looks like. Um, the corona is actually Latin for, for crown, so that's kind of where it got its name from. Uh, these, this virus has these protein lipid spikes that kind of protrude from this virus. And it has a, um, these lipid spikes are, are somewhat sticky, so that makes it um, challenging when it can stick to surfaces such as our hands or high touch point surfaces. Um, within the virus, there is an RNA material that uh, basically infects live host cells, which obviously we are full of live host cells. So this particular virus is not, they don't uh, categorize it as a, a live organism. It basically kind of sits dormant and lurks for um, it to kind of cling on and, and get into our bodies in various different ways. And we've seen a lot of the transmission modes from you know, coughing and sneezing, uh, hence all of the, the, the social distancing and um, you know, wearing um, face coverings and things like that, washing our hands. Those are all um, good things that help protect us when this virus does maybe attach itself to us. Um, what's been interesting in the community and in our research is that, um, you know, the, the virus has infectious properties that um, have kind of changed over the last, you know, eight, nine months. And some of the research um, we've seen studies early on, we saw studies that showed that the virus could maintain these infectious properties in the air for maybe a few hours. Um, there's a lot of factors that contribute to the, um, its ability to stay um, viral or, or alive in a sense in the air. And that has to do with um, the UV index, um, temperature, humidity, those things contribute to um, the airborne viability, but on surfaces, it's been um, uh, new studies just came out in Australia that show that it has a, uh, a three to four week potential viability on some surfaces. Um, so we're, we're kind of really still not sure how long it can maintain those properties on various surfaces. Um, <clears throat> again, the transmission mode we, we've, we've heard about, we've talked about, and you've seen on in throughout, obviously, a lot of the uh, media and the news is you know, coughing and sneezing and, uh, and even talking can transmit this from person to person. Um, as far as uh, the symptoms, they vary. Obviously, some people may be asymptomatic and some may uh, experience se severe life-threatening symptoms, mainly upper respiratory type symptoms, but it can it vary from person to person. So the, the, the problem that we're faced with, I'm imagining most of you on the call are probably, you know, contractors uh, or, or property managers or consultants that are, are, are dealing with this pandemic. Um, and rightfully so, we, we've all got to kind of join together to tackle this thing in the right way. Um, and so I think the, 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 the clear problem that we see is that we're kind of dealing with the COVID Wild West, as I call it. Um, you know, very, very um, inconsistent procedures, practices, technologies, chemistries that are being uh, used by some folks out there. And so, um, you know, what, what we call a standard of care in a lot of other industries, we really kind of are, are lacking a, a specific pathogen or COVID standard of care, uh, which consistently uh, 
utilizes and, and recognizes um, you know, the different cleaning and disinfection methodologies, the, the chemistries that are, are proper. We're, we've come a long ways, but we're still, we're still seeing a lot of folks out there that are um, not applying some of these things correctly. Um, lack of pathogen certification and training programs. So a, a lot of us, I, I, I'm assuming that a lot of you are in the restoration, maybe emergency response industry, and you uh, recognize some certifications and training that are specific to water damage, mold, asbestos, um, crime scene. You know, those are, those are um, specific trainings that we believe that need to be, um, you know, developed for this particular pathogen that we're dealing with. A lot of those are similarity. They have similarity um, or fundamentals that we would utilize for cleaning up, you know, a, a contaminated COVID project, but uh, that's, a, that's a really important component. If we are professionals providing professional services related to COVID, we need to have professional certification and training programs. So I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit here. Um, you know, lack of qualified ex, uh, experienced professionals. We're, we're seeing, seems like a lot of folks getting into this industry. Um, and some might be on the newer side, the greener side, um, and some might have you know, decades of experience cleaning up uh, properties and buildings that are contaminated with various other hazardous materials. Um, so if you guys have been in this industry, the restoration industry for a while, and I'm going back to the mold industry specifically, this probably looks very familiar to some of you. It looked familiar to Pete and I when we looked at this and said, we saw this 25 years ago. What, you know, what did we learn from the mold industry when we had no standard of care, uh, variety of uh, methodology be, methodologies being <clears throat> used and deployed, uncertified folks doing mold remediation. Um, <clears throat> what we did learn very early, um, and that's where I cut my teeth on is in, in the mold industry about 23 years ago, um, writing protocols for mold remediation projects, but we did see a huge influx of liability and lawsuits uh, like we are seeing with COVID right now. And so this is, um, this is familiar to a lot of us. So we figured that there needs to be a clear standard of care that we've all recognized. Uh, professionals that have the training, have the proper insurance, following protocols. Otherwise, I think we're going to be taking step backwards in, in managing this virus. And no one ever wants to uh, see each other in court. And so uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we're protecting ourselves as a company as best as we can in this industry. Um, next slide, please. So as far as certification or, or train and or training, uh, you know, we, we OSHA, CDC, Department of uh, Human Health Services, they have guidance documents out there that we've seen a lot of it pertaining to employee protection um, for, for folks that are doing COVID specific cleaning. Um, one interesting, uh, qu not quote, but right out of the statute from federal OSHA says that all employers, uh, and, and, and that's an important word right there. It's not just the folks that are going in cleaning uh, as professionals uh, buildings for COVID, it is all employers must train workers that have a reasonably anticipated occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And this, this, could, this could be from the cash register person to the truck driver. Uh, they have to have some level of training. Uh, and so we, I'll talk about the, that training course that we created for, for that level. And then there's obviously the professionals like you guys that are likely on the phone here that go in and, and do the deep disinfection and cleaning. My analogy I like to give is kind of like the dentist. When you go to the dentist, uh, you, you get your teeth cleaned by a professional, certified, licensed professional. Well, in between dental visits, you need to make sure that you are maintaining, you know, your dental hygiene, flossing and brushing. And so we, we believe that there's going to be, in the world of new normals, we believe there's going to be a new normal for building disinfection for professionals, licensed, qualified, certified, all of that good stuff. But in between a deep disinfection by professional, it's likely that employees of that building are going to be asked to clean their workspace. 
uh, to, to make sure that they can maintain the highest level of hygiene because obviously hiring a professional every week, every month, every, you know, every time there's an outbreak might get very expensive for, for that. So we all need to kind of, I think, you know, elevate the level of hygiene of our building, including some of the employees that are working there, maybe uh, asked to do some additional cleaning of their workspace. Um, so <clears throat> we've, we've uh, seen some, some violations uh, from Cal OSHA, from some of the other uh, state OSHAs, but this is becoming um, a, a very serious situation for employers, uh, specifically in California, which uh, I was on a call just the other day with uh, one of the, the, I think it was the director of, of Cal OSHA, and they have, um, their, their strike teams have issued violations for employers in the state of California that have violated some of these COVID mandates and some of the uh, aerosol transmittable disease standards. And some of these fines are from a couple hundred dollars to up to close to almost a hundred thousand dollars with some of the um, hospitals that were fined, um, food processing, uh, R&D, uh, supermarkets, a ver variety of employ employers were have been cited. And this goes beyond California. Other states have mandated and adopted some additional employee protective measures related to COVID-19. And um, it's, it's, we're seeing an increase in worker comp claims. We're seeing an increase in, um, in lawsuits, including some class action lawsuits against uh, their employees, against their employers. And a lot of it comes down to lack of documentation, lack of training. So um, we want to make sure that obviously that uh, you guys are all protected out there. Your companies are protected and, and um, we're, we're staying out of those courtrooms. Anything to add in there, Pete or Jason? Or I think, um, you know, from the standpoint of the job, I think what, uh, what you're, you're talking about is giving us a good understanding of we don't have a lot of rules of engagement like we do in say asbestos um, or even mold now. And that because of that doesn't give us license to go willy nilly that we are going to need to um, be trained, protect our people, protect our customers, uh, document and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see through this presentation, what we're doing is giving you an outline for what we see is best practices all the way through so that you can ensure that you limit your liability and exposure um, from your employees to your customer to your business so but i so this is great nate thank you yeah thanks pete uh so the way that and, and a lot of you may know this but if you don't osha looks at kind of you know how do we protect workers they look at a hazard a risk assessment is basically what it's called and so you, you guys may be performing covid cleaning and disinfection on projects that um, are low, what we would call a low risk um, situation or facility, um, all the way up to a very high risk. Uh, an example might be a high risk, might be a, a hospital situation with confirmed COVID patients. That would be different than a, you know, a construction site, which would be probably on the low, the low side of, of uh, employee hazard. So, you know, each project may have its own, um, assessment for risk and that and that will dictate which likely some levels of PPE your, your the chemistry you're using for cleaning and disinfection may trigger certain types of PPE but also the risk of the building may also add to that uh, that PPE personal protective equipment is is uh, the term PPE we use a lot of analogies as <laughs> some of you've already probably caught on um, <clears throat> engineering controls so in some situations, particularly when you get to probably a medium or high risk facility or situation confirmed positive, it may be necessary to set up engineering controls, uh, which would be things like containment, negative pressure, filtration. Uh, those, are, those are things to minimize risk, uh, contain you know, uh, areas that are uh, contaminated potentially. Um, and, and similar to what we might, you might see if um, you've been in the mold or sewage or um, asbestos or lead abatement industries, you, you're, you're familiar with containment. Um, one thing that we have seen that's a little bit more aggressive is the air changes per hour 
So in, a, in an asbestos or a hazardous material situation, mold included uh, four air changes is pretty much recognized as the, the standard for the amount of volume of air you've got to exchange. Well, in COVID projects, particularly when you get to hospitals, you likely might be required to increase the air changes uh, within that contained area to six to 12. So a little bit more aggressive approach. And that's really to just minimize the, the, um, the potential for cross-contamination. Uh, next slide, Jace. So I, I kind of mentioned a lot of this already that again, PPE, typically we're gonna be using on COVID jobs. Again, it can, can can vary, but you might often see folks that are using the, the same kind of PPE as you've seen in the picture here. Um, you know, protective clothing, gloves, uh, respiratory protection can vary. Obviously with um, kind of the shortage with some of the, the raw materials, N95 respirators are sometimes harder to find. You may be going with a, a P100 half face or full face respirator, uh, particularly if you're into a high risk building, you're gonna want probably a little bit more additional type of uh, or level of PPE. Um, but it, it's it, in some situations, it might, it might be gloves in, a, in an N95 um, type respirator. Uh, it really kind of would depend on the type of facility. And definitely make sure, Nate, that, you know, the training that gets involved with this, if you're, um, some companies are saying, look, we're just going to go full face so we can protect the eyes and HEPA filtration. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you have your fit testing up to date and your annual fit test and your medical evaluation that they're trained on taking the suits on and off because this is a virus. And like you said, it's a, it's a clingy one, you know, donning and doffing your, your Tyvek suits become uh, even more important. Uh, this was a unique one because in the past, it always felt like PPE was to protect you, just your employee. And now in this case, you're actually protecting your employee from recontaminating potentially the virus they may or may not have um, into the space. Um, so the PPE becomes really important, but it's a double-edged sword. It's kind of unique. I'm trying to think of other scenarios, maybe asbestos where you could take it into another room and so on and so forth. But this one's really unique because it, it uh, requires us to make sure we're not, we're protecting both the, the receiver of the, pro, the, the uh, treatment and the person itself. So that training and understanding, you know, do you have the right, um, do you have the right equipment and are your people trained for it? Um, we're seeing lots of stuff on social media where you're seeing all levels of service done with minimal PPE and casual attire, um, all sorts of stuff where you're just, um, you know, you're putting your employees at risk and you're at risk of doing a poor job as well. Yeah, I, I did uh, uh, several months ago, I did kind of a funny skit uh, uh, and I covered myself in uh, shaving cream. I had this kind of level of uh, PPE was wearing and, and basically kind of showed how some might just doff or another term is to get out of your PPE. Those are kind of our fancy terms, donning and doffing. But, you know, I, I kind of showed how easy it is to cross contaminate you know, if you don't take off or doff your PPE properly, you could have, you know, in this case, it was shaving cream, but I, I was, it was more of a comical skit, but it was a reality that some folks that don't understand how to properly doff the PPE could recontaminate their, their hands and not, and not know it and, and then go, well, they're going to go grab their cell phone, make a call, itch their eyes. Um, and, and so it's, it's it kind of understanding that level of it, we're dealing with an invisible virus, obviously. Um, so, you know, who's out there cleaning these buildings? We've got a lot of, we need a lot of folks uh, to be at the front lines to clean and disinfect buildings. Um, so we see a lot of the restoration folks, which I, I think are probably the most equipped and, and probably qualified to handle asbestos abatement, hazardous material abatement, those types of folks that kind of do this day in and day out on buildings, um, whether it's crime scene or, or hazardous, has whopper, hazardous materials, um, even it, the janitorial custodial folks that understand, you know, some levels of cleaning. Um, we are seeing a lot of influx of other industries getting into COVID cleaning. And so we wanna make sure that, um, 
again, kind of going back to the mold industry, we saw this as well. And, and everyone was jumping in, seeing a new opportunity. Uh, but we, we got to be careful that we don't run in too quick and not have the, the proper, uh, you know, training and qualifications and, and even insurance, which we, we may talk about in different uh, webinars. So, um, well, I think to that point, uh, Nate, real quick on the, on that piece, you know, as you're looking at this, you know, you do want to make sure your contracts are up to date. Um, your contracts previous, if you're a restoration contractor, might include language like pre, um, previous, uh, pre-loss condition, um, those kind of terminologies that there's no way you can guarantee that you can do this in this environment, especially with no clearance testing and so on and so forth. So make sure you review the, your contracts, review your insurance policies with your agent. Um, everything I've read and, and discussed with agents, general liability would not cover any kind of um, issue that you might generate on, you know, and be involved in. Uh, pollution liability is, is touchy as well. They, they were meant for bacteria and uh, mold release and, and asbestos and lead release. It wasn't intended for a pandemic virus. Uh, doesn't mean it might not be covered, but you might you want to go through this with your insurance agent. Let them know you're doing this type of work, and make sure you guys are on the same page so you have you understand your defensible position. Yeah, good, good, excellent point. Um, I think there's a significant percentage of people out there that probably are doing this work that don't have proper insurance. And you have to ask yourself as an owner, you know, am I, if things go south, I get sued, somebody gets COVID and our, our, our company or a, a customer does, and there's a lawsuit, are, are we protected? So we, uh, that may be another, another webinar we can do um, on the more of the legal side. So obviously the, the OSHA requirements, they've, they've been in place. That is for, uh, you know, employee protection. The Pathogen Alliance specifically has designed industry-specific, COVID-specific uh, training and certification courses. So like a lot of our other industries have uh, specific training and certification, we've created a training course uh, that we've created based on the fundamentals of a lot of the restoration and the abatement uh, foundational, you know, containment and, and negative pressure things we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, but this is something that is a no brainer in my mind. If we're going to be professionals charging professional rates, we need to have professional certification. And so this is obviously a certify a certification for specifically for COVID uh, will help reduce against any potential lawsuits that come your way. Hopefully that never happens. Um, it's also going to demonstrate that we are creating as an industry, a COVID standard of care, just like 25 years ago, we had to create a standard of care for the mold industry that didn't exist. Uh, this is a massive opportunity for all of you on the, on the call. And, but, the, but we have, we, we've got to do this right. And we've got to, we got to make sure we're consistent with, uh, again, training, the application of chemistry. Uh, if, if, if we don't, then it's going to continue to be the Wild West. And, and some people are going to get pulled into lawsuits and probably may not survive. And this is, a, this is different than mold in the, in the fact that obviously it can result in, in death for some folks that may have pre-existing conditions or immune compromised systems. So, um, this also may be an opportunity to, to a certification, maybe an opportunity to help uh, market your services uh, so that someone who, who's hiring you sees that, well, you've gone through a specific pathogen certification course versus someone who is just uh, claiming they can go in and um, what I call spray and pray. Um, so we want to avoid that. Uh, so our, our, our group, uh, again, as I mentioned, we put together a, a pathogen-specific uh, training course. We have a professional level, which is really about an hour and a half course. It's designed for professionals that have already kind of been in this industry, like the restoration, the abatement, the emergency responders. Uh, it, it's, 
so you guys already have a general understanding of cleaning and disinfection and some of the things. So it's, um, it's designed, you know, for, for that uh, type of audience. Um, we are a third party uh, credentialing training provider. We, uh, we have a specific insurance policy that allows us to provide this particular pathogen um, training, which makes us uh, quite unique. Uh, what, for us to qualify for that, by the way, was very difficult um, and was, uh, you know, as you can imagine, some of the insurance folks are a little uneasy about insuring certain people that may not have experience or credentials or any of that. So we have uh, an advisory board that's uh, pretty impressive with their own uh, credentials in various industries. So, uh, you know, credibility of your training program is, is huge when it comes to defending yourself uh, that, you know, you've gone through a credible training program. Um, obviously, our, you know, when you guys are going and doing cleaning and disinfection and, and disinfecting of buildings, we're never going to be saying things like it's COVID free or it's, de it's, it's we've disinfected your building. We want to use clever words that give us some, some, some squishiness, as I call it. But, you know, we are applying disinfectants um, is a little bit uh, of a safer kind of a uh, less um, insinuating that we've disinfected your building and it's COVID free. We know that's never going to be going to be the, the case. Just like when you if you've been on a mold project, we don't say it's mold free because we know that mold is everywhere. And in the minute the water loss comes back, the potential for mold to grow again. So uh, we can only do the best we can with the knowledge we have and the, the tools and the equipment and the chemistry that we um, are, that's available to us. Okay, um, next slide. There's uh, just a list of some of our advisors on our advisory board that helped us prepare. Um, as I mentioned, the, the course is a little under two hours. Um, we also have a, a training course. I think it's the next slide, Jay, if you can go to that one. Uh, um, that's uh, an office worker. So you guys um, who are cleaning buildings, the building occupants employees per OSHA have to have some level of training. So we have about a, it's about a 40 minute training course that is for the office worker who has common high touch point surfaces, mouse pads, uh, keyboards, cubicles. Um, those are going to have similar uh, you know, office high touch point surfaces regardless of the industry. So that's an opportunity for you guys to make sure that your customers are in compliance with OSHA. And then there's obviously people that don't work in an office setting. So we created a non-office worker. So someone in the warehouse, someone that's uh, you know, a bartender, uh, driving a truck, they're going to have a variety of different high touch point surfaces and, and things that they may uh, need to routinely clean or be asked by their employer to clean. But they, you can't just hand a chemical to an employee and say, here, go clean this and, and without any kind of level of training. That's where the liability is going to, to come in for uh, some of your customers. And our classes are in English and Spanish. Okay. Next slide. Did we freeze? Yeah, it looks, J Jason, can you hear us okay? Jason's on mute. There, there we go. Jason, I don't know if your uh, mic's working because we cannot hear you. Okay, Nate, thank Good you. Good old internet. Good old internet. Um, so piggybacking off of Nate's uh, report there, I wanted to get a little more specific and talk about some of the um, breakouts of his discussion. One of them being protocols and documentation. Um, one of the things that Nate had talked about is you could be on a project where there's a CIH, a third party, uh, that will design a project. Those are the best projects to have. Um, that way, the contractor or the building owner isn't defining the scope. So they can take as much into uh, account about the building, about the scenario, about the um, 
cause of the loss or removal of the, the virus as possible. And in fact, Nate's been on a few uh, as a third party as well, especially in the early days of COVID. But I'm, most of us are not running into um, projects with this, uh, I would call it a luxury. It's ideal and mold, it's, you, you know, most people aren't doing a mold job unless there's a third party in the beginning or a third party, at least in the end to, to clear the job. So in most cases, you're defining your own scope. You're taking your own risk assessment. You're looking at the objectives and the client's expectations. And what we're seeing in this more than anything else, I've seen some large big box jobs where in May, they would have probably had you uh, clean and disinfect the entire facility, you know, from a Walmart to a Target. Now due to cost, they're limiting contractors' uh, scope. They're saying, okay, just hit the uh, cashier's area and the bathrooms and the break room. So high touch points. So we're seeing a lot of that change. We're probably all part of that. Um, frankly, I've seen it where there's people still in the store and there's staff completely suited up and doing this cleaning. So it's gotten really interesting and I'm sure the stories would go farther and farther. Um, you know, because of this protocol and documentation component, you wanna make sure, you know, you've got your safety so you want to be um, from staff to materials and to the building and account. Sometimes I know guys will put together a package on a big project. They'll have the diagram of the store or the facility. Um, so to show that they, as much as they can prove, hey, we went and we did all these areas and we highlighted these high touch points. Products. Uh, products is something, uh, especially on social media, I brought that up earlier. You're seeing so many things. You're seeing products make tons of promises. Uh, you're seeing uh, products being used improperly just by, by what you see on social media and, and pictures. So you just want to be completely mindful and document the products you use and make sure they're safe, they're EPA registered, and people are trained to use it. Engineering controls, as Nate talked about, in a lot of cases, we're not seeing a lot of this, but you have to determine, especially if you don't have a third party, you have to determine, do you have to add negative pressure? Do you have to add filtration, containment? What do you have to do to get this project set up correctly uh, and safely? Next slide. Documentation. So as we get into this, a lot of this is, you know, just literally building the case that you did this work um, and that you did it correctly at that time. Um, I think one of, the, one of the questions or one of the statements on here was you're selling a service, not an outcome. Um, so you wanna build your case. You wanna limit your liability. And to, and to um, Nate's previous statements, just because there's no standard, there is as a professional, we do have standards we have to abide by. You wanna deploy the proper cleaning and disinfection procedures. Uh, you want to properly apply the chemistry you're using. You wanna take photos. And in some cases, people are ATP sampling for cleanliness. That's not telling you if there's COVID or not, but that's telling you if the surface is relatively clean pre before and after as a way to kind of test the cleaning. So all these things you wanna take into consideration as you build your case um, off your protocol or the um, third party protocol. The other thing I'll note is um, if you want Procure on their website it has a CIH um, protocol from AG Wasserman that's a fillable PDF. Uh, it does, it's not industry specific, so it could apply from a home to a uh, office building to a restaurant. You would have to adjust it to make sure it fits the criteria, but it's a series of questions that ask you from your employees to PPE used, to the chemicals used, so on and so forth. So it's a great template to say, am I meeting the mark on all these processes and can I tell the story after I'm done with the job? Okay, next slide. Nate, can you yep. hear us? Yes. We have a couple of questions and I thought maybe this might be a good pl place to, to do this that relate to protocols and certification. Uh, the first question that came in, uh, Nate and Pete, is, are you aware of any current uh, municipality, county, state, or federal, any requirements for certification yet? And um, would you anticipate, if not, would you anticipate seeing some in the near future? 
Uh, so as it, as a shall or a must, no, I haven't seen any requirements. Um, will, will we see that in the near future? Uh, it is very, very likely with, with the amount of, um, misinformation or or unvetted technologies being used I, I could easily see that some states may require just like what in, in Texas you have a requirement for mold remediation you have to have a state license right you have to be state certified and some other states just have that as well so I could easily see that this could in the short and, and very quickly require a certification to do this type of work otherwise again I think what we've seen there's more it seems to be there's more folks out there doing things incorrectly than correctly. And that, and that makes us nervous as an economy, as a, as a health crisis, we are not performing this work correctly. It's going to, it's going to affect all of us. So I, I could easily see it being a, a mandated requirement, just like asbestos, you know, abatement, uh, asbestos testing, it's federally uh, regulated and required, but some States uh, I could easily see that being, or counties requiring it. Yeah, I think your point, your, to your point, Nate, real quick, it is just like mold. And those that were involved in mold in the early days, we had a standard level of performance. And then a lot of the a lot of stuff that we did back then is still, you know, is the standard today. So a lot of this is the beginning of the standard, I would, I would think. You know, one other thing I'll add to that is I know a lot of states increasingly, we've got, we've got uh, attendees on here from all across the country, but I think a majority of states now do have a requirement that there's a qualified individual that's certified within that state if you apply a, a pesticide, uh, which is a disinfectant, for an application and, and a charge for that service. So I uh, would you know, recommend everybody just connect up with their state department of agriculture or their state department of environmental quality, depending upon which state. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot of requirements for that. Um, Next question, we had, a, we had a question as it related to um, the violations that you're seeing. Um, uh, Nate, you mentioned the Cal OSHA and some other states and that sort of thing, and that the majority of the violations were due to documentation or lack of training. Can you be a little bit more specific what, what, what you might see in that from that perspective and that people need to make sure that they're cautious about? Yeah, from, from the discussion from the gentleman from, from Cal OSHA, the so the state of California and other states may have state-specific requirements. California has a standard 5199 that is an aerosol, aerosol, aerosolized transmittable disease standard that requires certain things. And, and many of the violations, and it's all listed, the violations are listed on, on Cal OSHA's website. So um, it's, it's, you can see the, the dollar figures and they show what the violation or citation is for. These are all COVID citations and, and many of them were not having a, an ATD standard, not having proper um, you know, training of their employees. Um, some of it was not maintaining the social distancing requirements and some other things, but mm -hmm. a lot of it was you know, not having that, that emergency response plan for how are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna respond? How do we have documented and trained employees so it's, it, it, it's, you know, a lot of that paperwork stuff that we have to do with, you know, just about everything in this industry, but sure. um, you know, obviously we cannot hundred percent prevent, I mean, we, we're in a, I always say this in my, my training classes is that our industry is not risk-free. We will always have risks. We have to manage our risks and document and show that we're managing our risks or minimizing our risks. So, um, but, but these, these citations and violations were again, not, industry, not the, not the folks that are likely on our call, they were employers of just regular businesses. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's transferring, not just to the, the emergency responders that are cleaning the, the buildings, but the actual occupant of the building need to make sure they're in compliance with. So that's our, our callers, customers that need to be uh, aware of some of this stuff. Perfect. Uh, Kristen, do you want to, uh, any other questions on, that have come up on protocols? or um, on certification? Um, just a couple comments just on um, insurance and um, basically, you know, with that and the requirements of training, some people are saying that they're seeing that the insurance brokers are requiring that. What are you guys seeing in the, in the field? 
I, you know, I, uh, yes, I am seeing the same thing. I'm sure Nate is seeing the same thing. That's the premise for a lot of the training um, is that the insurance company wants something and they may not know what they want. They want some form of training. Some are accepting, um, like Nate mentioned earlier, some of the certifications for biohazard or trauma or uh, mold may apply, but they, they're looking for something to separate them from the animals so that they know there's some standard level of care. Um, I don't know that I'm seeing anything hard and fast that's uh, other than things like PR2 training that will apply, but they are asking and wanting something to, um, you know, make sure that their clients are mitigating their risk. Yeah, we, we've had several discussions with various insurance um, folks trying to just see where, where their heads are. And obviously they're in the game of minimizing risk, as Pete mentioned. So uh, it would make perfect sense for them to require if you're going to be doing this particular type of work, you're going to need an, a, a, a policy that has a communicable disease endorsement. Most, most people have an exclusion for viruses, as Pete mentioned. To qualify to get that endorsement, many of these insurance folks are, are going to require specific training. And, and some of us are probably aware of the IICRC and some other folks that have um, fabulous training and certifications for specific, you know, water, mold, fire. Uh, this is no different. And so don't be surprised if the insurance companies require some level of pathogen disinfection training. And, and it just makes perfect sense for them to minimize their risk and liability because you know, this is, this is scramble mode. Like we saw 25 years ago in the mold industry where, you know, people are trying to figure it out. Luckily we kind of have that to fall back on and, and utilize what we've learned. Uh, but yes, I, I, I absolutely think that specific pathogen disinfection certification will be required to even qualify to get the proper insurance. Great. Thank you guys for that. So back to our webinar. Yeah. Our next topic is chemistry. Um, one of the, this is what, you know, Procure does, but we also see it as an area where it gets minimized. People pick a product um, for various reasons, from cost to uh, familiarity, etc. But we want to make sure that all your employees and customers understand the technology that you choose and that you understand it as it relates to the building materials, etc. You want to make sure that the label that you read and understand for example, do you have to rinse? On the deodorizing side, we've run into a couple scenarios where a company has said, hey, your product has created a tacky surface. And as we did research, they used a product as a degreaser that required rinsing and they didn't rinse. Uh, so it was that product. So I can't, under, can't overstate how important it is to read the label and understand the product. Uh, have the SDS available. Verify that it's on the list N for the EPA. Um, make sure you have PPE that's adequate for the chemistry selected. We've talked, um, you know, in the case of Procure at the disinfection strain, no PPE is required, but clearly if you're going into a COVID positive, you wanna be fully PPE. But if you're using another product, it may require you to wear special gloves. It may require you to wear a, a gas cartridge as a filter instead of just the HEPA. So you want to be mindful. It's not just PPE, it's not just a standard thing. You also got to make sure it matches the technology you're going to use. The, you want to verify dwell times. This is probably one of the most important parts beyond being on the list end as it relates to COVID. What's the dwell time? Uh, we've all seen those pictures and videos, and we see it every day in restaurants, especially if we've gone out since the pandemic. Somebody sprays some product, an unmarked bottle, on a, on a table and then wipes. And you're saying, well, that's got to be a one-second dwell time. So know your dwell times. With Procure, we always recommend that as you know, the guys go through and they do the application of the product, they make sure that after... Uh, they make their turn or finish the zone. They know it's at least 10 minutes and then go do any wiping if necessary. In case of Procure, it's no rinse, so there may be none. Um, and does the, ke the chemistry select that you select match the sprayer? We're seeing, a, we're seeing a, and hearing a lot about fogging. Does the product that you pick, uh, does it work in a fogger? 
And are you going to get called on that as part of your documentation? So make sure all those things work together. Thank you. In the case of Procure, uh, Procure V specifically, we are a no rinse product that if you read the label and went through it, you know we're safe in, in public facilities, restaurants, we're food safe, Omri, organic for those in California, just kidding, uh, hospitals, etc. So it's for use in all those areas. And it's no rinse, breaks down to water and salt vapor, so no harmful chemical footprint and needs to go through a sprayer that allows you to have a dwell time and contact surface time that hits the surface, stays in a wet state for up to 10 minutes. And again, those kind of things would need to be included in your documentation. And that would be in your training with your staff to understand if your staff's using multiple different products, you would meet with the team before, hey, we're doing a restaurant, we're gonna use this product, we're gonna use Procure. Understand that dwell time is 10 minutes, another product may be 12. And so you just wanna make sure you all are communicating that, no one's sitting there with a timer, but you wanna let the product work. And that is part of building your training and documentation and so forth, okay? Um, real quick, Pete, on that, um, I, I'll, I'll share a quick story on a project we were on, a high-risk high facility, confirmed positive. We had to kind of oversee the contractor that was following our scope, but we had to document that the dwell time remained. So we basically did start the clock. We, we oh, wow. verified when it was applied, and then we confirmed it was wet after the, the prescribed contact time. So insert, again, from that documentation you, you, you as a contractor would love to have that someone verifying that we met the dwell time and, you know, the dwell time is based on, you know, the kill claims for the product. So uh, you, you couldn't have said it better. A lot of temptation to just spray and wipe off um, or, or the, maybe that just naturally evaporates quicker and doesn't meet that dwell time. Well, now you're not getting your kill claims. Right. And this is all just information that as, you go through it, if you understand this and are able to articulate this and document that the ability to poke holes in your processes and your procedures are gonna be limited. You already now are on this and they have hired a professional. So as it relates to application, so we've kind of gone through the gamut of, you know, the why and the, and the you know, what, what do we do, uh, pr protocols, how do we select the chemistry and now we're looking at applications. And again, these are brief overviews there are training, you know, there are specific trainings for this, but we figured we need to walk through the process to kind of see, to kind of check your game or determine if you want to get into this. Um, it is critical to understand, to determine if you're needing to clean the surface prior to applying disinfectant products. I know in the, um, a lot of cases, you're coming in clearly just to disinfect. There is a janitorial service uh, that already does cleaning potentially, especially if it's just preventative. And so that falls in the next one where you want to determine, is it positive or preventative? We're seeing a lot of janitorial teams coming in and doing a lot of preventative. Um, and they're doing it well. They're really good at cleaning. And they're um, applying the product to the specifications. And they're wearing the appropriate PPE. That's great. COVID positive would come into a play where you actually have an active. So PPE might be stepped up. We see a lot of, um, we see a lot of, janitorial companies that are going in with limited PPE and N95, maybe some gloves and no Tyvek suit. But if you got a COVID positive, you want to be fully, fully prepped for that. So that's important to know. Um, do you, and you want to focus on high touch surfaces. So as opposed to mold and some other um, cleaning and other things we do, this one's very interesting. So if you do a grocery store, for example, you know, you are cleaning all the high touch areas and disinfecting but you're probably not going to disinfect the top of the freezer, areas that people aren't going to come in contact with. You're gonna focus on the doorknobs, the high touch points, the light switches, the faucets, the phones, the keyboards, the, the mouse, et cetera. So you really wanna recreate what people are gonna to touch and pass around to each other. Okay, next slide. Uh, and, and just to add real quick to that. So the, the one thing I think is so critical and I think, is being missed out there a lot is the 
uh, spraying of a disinfectant before cleaning a surface. So those high touch point surfaces, they transfer our oil and greases from our hands. Most disinfectants are water-based. So oil and water don't mix as we know. So if you spray a disinfectant over an, an oily doorknob that looks shiny, um, it, it likely will reject that disinfectant. So the, the, it's so critical. It's a two-step process. Clean that surface before it's uh, going to be um, you know, disinfected or a, a, and a disinfectant will be applied to that surface. Right. right. In the case of, uh, this is the case if you're using Procure on the applications, you would start farthest from the entrance that you entered the building and you're gonna exit the building and you work your way back, start high and work low to low. And then to um, Nate's, the Nate's statement, a lot of crews are going in and misting the product on all the surfaces and then coming back and with a smaller, like a 32 ounce bottle in that picture and a microfiber cloth and then detailing out the high touch points and all those areas to make sure to remove any, any potential grime um, to uh, make sure that you highlight those areas and all those areas that the handle are touched, all those areas of the cash register are touched um, and so forth. You wanna make sure you apply the disinfectant products evenly and refer to the label for the amount of square footage per gallon to get an idea how much, you know, if I'm doing 10,000 square feet and it covers a thousand square feet per gallon, then I'm gonna need 10 gallons and I wanna make sure I have enough product. Um, and that you're, you know, you've used it all at the end. I, one of the things that I do say that's bad about restoration, especially is disinfectants, I think are completely misused on water damages and sewage damages. But if you just look at everybody's sprayers, it would tell you that everybody, when we first started doing this, we would go and find a sprayer at the shop of the business. It's, oh yeah, we've, you know, we use X to, as a disinfectant on antimicrobial, we use this on biohazard. And their sprayers were broken. The tips were a mess. There's no even spray. Uh, their pump up two gallon sprayers and so forth. So can't stress enough about the importance of your equipment being ready to go because the consequences of a poor application on a water, cat one water damage are very different than um, misapplying a product on a, on a COVID-19 project. Great. Well, we appreciate it, Nate and Pete, for, for walking us through those really important agenda items, especially today, as we're always trying to instill confidence um, in environments, uh, whether it's for staff or for customers um, uh, who are accessing those environments. So we really appreciate that. Chris, I know we've got questions, so why don't we jump into some of the questions that the, the team has, and then we're going to wrap up in the next uh, five or 10 minutes. So please go ahead, Kristen. Perfect, perfect. I've got three. Um, Couple questions. Oh, how do you guys feel about fogging and electrostatic sprayers? Uh, I, I'll take that one. So those are delivery mechanisms. Um, it, I think with there's a temptation to use a, a fogger or an e electrostatic sprayer um, because it's it's quick and you can you know run run someone through a building pretty quick. But again. It comes down to are those hand touch point surfaces or potentially contaminated surfaces, are they, are they clean before they're going to be um, an application of a disinfectant? And as Pete mentioned, you know, you have to have proper amount of coverage of that. So is a fogger or a, a electrostatic sprayer going to deliver the proper amount of, of uh, disinfectant to that surface? Uh, if, you know, it may depend on how far it is from the surface. So... I, I don't think, I, I think you can use some of these applications if the product obviously is, is, you know, allows that delivery mechanism, but the temptation of going in and fogging the air is something that we, we shouldn't be doing as a sole disinfection procedure. We've got to, we can use different, you know, uh, fogging or electrostatic spraying methods, but make sure we're wetting that surface properly. It's designed for that, that device. Um, that would be my, my two cents. Yeah, we've definitely seen that fogging um, certainly uh, excites the mind of a restoration contractor for, some, for the reason I think it, it's the fear of getting things wet, the fear um, of getting, you know, too, there's too much, too much detail on a large project. 
we've seen this with uh, on procure on deodorizing projects, the, the fear of getting, um, you know, soft goods wet and it's safe on soft goods, but it, but it's, it, it's, it's contrary to our nature as the way we were raised to keep things dry and not to, to, to saturate things. So I think that's been one of the reasons, but to Nate's point, just, you got to make sure does the chemistry that you've selected match the uh, equipment that you're going to disperse the product in. And a lot of times you'd be surprised what you find out and what you learn. You just want to make sure, cause that again is building your case in the wild, wild west to say, Oh yeah, we fogged, product X and that product X is clearly not designed to be fogged. And, and the other thing to add to that is that you, we're aerosolizing, you know, micron droplet sizes. So that, that could be a potential risk for the occupants. Uh, we had a hospital with patients that the, the contractor wanted to, to uh, fog and I, and, 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 areas where there are patients on ventilators. And we said, no, no way. Um, we have to be mindful of that. We may be wearing our PPE, but occupants may not be wearing the same PPE. So if we aerosolize these disinfectants, that could be a potential risk and, and liability to us. So, um, you know, it depends on the situation. A vacant building is obviously different than an occupied, but keep that in mind as well. These are aerosolized droplets. That, that's a great point, Nate. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, the EPA has just recently given guidance to manufacturers like Procure of, of how to go about testing products through, through an electrostatic sprayer as an example. Um, it's very clear through that guidance from the EPA that <clears throat> they are going to require uh, respiratory protection to applicators as well. So not just a um, great point of, of protecting people that might be in that, an occupied environment, um, but don't forget um, your staff that are doing the applications. So it's pretty clear that the EPA is going to require respiratory protection for all products that go through um, electrostatic sprayer because of that small micron size um, um, droplet and how it could potentially impact negatively your respiratory system. So great answer. Kristen? Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next one will be related to um, the validity of residual kill claims or what about the nanotechnology coatings that are that promising uh, disinfection protection for days or weeks on end? Yeah, so there's been, it seems like there's been uh, a, a lot of talk about this. Uh, I, I don't know. I think the jury may still be out on the validity of, you know, guaranteeing surfaces, that um, can't maintain uh, the virus on it, if, if I'm stating that correctly. But um, I, you know, anything anything that sounds uh, basically, I think we've got to get you know federal agencies to in, in endorse or approve of these these claims. I mean, without that, I think it's it's a a, a very tempting marketing you know um, selling point that oh we we you know we we applied this and it's going to guarantee that. Uh, whatever the guarantee claims are. So I, I would refer back to EPA, CDC, World Health, um, OSHA, you know, f recognized, globally recognized agencies that uh, will have to kind of get behind this, just like the EPA's list N that Pete talked about, you know, it, it, those are, those are approved. Um, that's an approved list by EPA that, you know, we're, we're using uh, vetted chemistries that, have documentation to, you know, do what they're supposed to do. And so I, I would kind of defer if EPA says that, you know, those, those claims are, are valid, then I think it's something that maybe we look at uh, and maybe still so early in the, in the technology game, but I think everyone's jockeying for position to try to get to, you know, what's going to give a, an owner, you know, some comfort to, well, we won't have to call you back for three months or whatever, but I, you know, it, it, I, you're, seeing a lot of, you're seeing a lot of word salad out there. I know that I'm seeing stuff and then you start reading through it and you see EPA, then you see, you know, disinfects for, you know, keeps disinfecting and all these different things coming at you. But if you pull it apart, unfortunately, that's what we do. So we're always reading that stuff and following up. But you pull it apart and it's two separate products. One is EPA registered. The other one is not. So you know, you, you know, you're kind of put in a weird spot and to Nate's thing, this was early on in mold, you know, people wanted to get rid of mold with magic, you know, liquid or gas and what have you. But if you talk to a CIH or anybody, you know, an expert in these fields, you still have to remove it. 
And so, you know, it all comes down to the same thing. You're cutting it out. If it's embedded in the drywall, you're probably cutting it out, you know. And you can see the industry still, you know, 20 some odd years later, you, every once in a while you catch something where you don't have to remove it. You just spray it or something that, to that effect. And still today, we haven't got a good answer for that without good old fashioned fashion, remove and disinfect. And so I think that's the same thing here is that if it sounds like that and there's a contractor, if you want to take that kind of risk, I don't even know how you back it up. And so just be careful because again, you want to mitigate your risk, you want to be a professional and you certainly don't want to get people hurt when giving them false confidence. Well said. Thank you, thank you for that one. Uh, last question here. Um, are you guys seeing, um, is anyone using hydroxyl or ozone as part of their mitigation procedures for COVID-19? I am not seeing any. Um, again, to, to me and, and Nate will probably reiterate, I don't see any of that on the EPA list N. I don't see any of that in uh, hygienist protocols. Um, there are no, so how much, you know, how many hydroxyls and, you know, for how long and what size, size space, we don't see any of these components. And so again, you know, I know these companies are pushing into that space and making that claim. They're not registered, they're not EPA registered, they're not on protocols. But man, if it just helps my workspace, I might throw a hydroxyl in the office. That's very different than a professional coming in and putting it in and making a statement. And so to me, that kind of falls in that same vein of, you know, as a contractor, professional contractor, with professional liability insurance, is that something you want to attach yourself to without, without the documentation and the, and the certification, et cetera? Yeah, I'll add to that. There, there's there's a lot of uh, magic bullets that are kind of being you know tossed around. It's you know again, uh, ozone, UV, uh, hydroxyls, uh, filtration. You you won't see those on EPA's list N because because those are pesticidal devices. Uh, EPA does not does not review the efficacy of pesticidal devices for killing bacteria and viruses. Now some of them. Uh, might have some benefit. We probably use, some of you may have used hydroxyls and ozone for odor control. And, and, and so there's some, there are probably some benefits for certain bacteria and certain mold, uh, mold and maybe viruses, but specifically for SARS-CoV-2, EPA does not, won't endorse pesticidal devices. They, they're in the business of uh, reviewing and approving chemicals that are, that are specifically designed for uh, this particular virus. So I would, like Pete said, I would be very cautious to, you know, maybe it's supplementary, maybe it's for odor control, but it is not the primary, you know, disinfection technology that should be used. And, and also, by the way, ozone, you, you have to realize that ozone has a permissible exposure limit. There's safety concerns, there's degradation of building materials that could occur, uh, that could get you into, if you're in certain parts of the country, like Southern California, you might have air pollution control districts or air quality management districts that, that limit the amount of ozone you can use. Um, a lot of byproducts, very reactive gas. So it could actually create more problems, mm -hmm. especially if you've got high technical equipment that could be damaged. Um, so I, I think we stick to the what's known, what's approved, and that's list ends, EPA's list end for emerging pathogen disinfectants. Got it. We have about one more question if you guys would like um, to address this one. Um, how does the humidity, UV or temperature affect the virus's long longevity? That's a great question. Uh, I think it's Homeland Security on their website has a, uh, I don't know what you call it, a scale or something that you can actually, so the, the virus, it, prefers doesn't doesn't like high temperature air temperature um, compared to high so so 95 degree versus 75 degrees it's going to prefer it's going to it's going to maintain infectious properties uh, lower temperatures um, it also enjoys or prefers a lower uh, uh, relative humidity so in humid environments the the half life or the uh, the, the, the degradation of the the virus um, it, it in humid environments doesn't prefer that. So if you've got a dry, cool climate uh, with a low UV index, it, it's gonna have a longer half-life 
than it would if it were in a, a hotter temperature uh, or more of a humid temperature. So, you know, again, though, I think they're still looking at, so there's a pretty cool thing on the Homeland Security website, I believe that you can, you can put in a specific temperature, RH, if you know the UV index, you can put that in there as well. But, and then they also have a, a scale or model. So that is for um, survivability of the virus in the air. They also have one for surfaces. So it, it, it's kind of a, a really neat um, way to just see you know, in general, I guess, what it prefers or what, what, you know, how quickly or less quickly it could um, not maintain those infectious properties. We're still Perfect. obviously learning a lot about yeah. this virus. Well, as we started off, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, and we continue to learn every day. Nate and Pete, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your knowledge, uh, uh, what you're seeing actually supervising or uh, helping develop, develop protocols for specific jobs. Uh, that are COVID-19 uh, related. We really appreciate you both joining us today as a part of this webinar. I wanted to share uh, with the entire uh, group on our webinar today, <clears throat> Pete and Nate's uh, contact information. You'll see it right here. You'll also see it in the recording. We've provided their, web, um, their email addresses. I also wanted to drive you to uh, share with you as well the, the websites. Uh, for Procure, it's uh, Procure1, the number one, dot com. Uh, so please uh, uh, visit us there. Uh, for the Pathogen Response and Resource Alliance, uh, it's, it's pathogenalliance.com. Again, you'll find the 800 numbers for both organizations uh, at those websites, as well as later this week, recordings of the webinar. With that, I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to remind you, there's a, just a very brief survey after you leave our webinar today. It will help us continue to make this um, valuable to you and, uh, and give us an insights as to what you'd like to see in our next webinar. So on behalf of the entire crew, I wanna thank you very much for joining us today and wish you a happy and healthy rest of the year. Thank you. <laughs>